Uh, the title of this presentation is uh, Transcranial Photobiomodulation Dosimetry, Integrating Human Data and Penetration Model. I'm Paolo Cassano. I work at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. So here are my disclosures uh, of note. Uh, I'm a co-founder of a company in the um, light uh, photobiomodulation um, field. However, I'm not employed by this company. So first of all, uh, a brief introduction about uh, photobiomodulation. Uh, um, it's a technique uh, to stimulate and neuromodulate the brain through near infrared light. Now here you can see the different uh, type of lights. Um, and uh, now uh, near infrared light is depicted in red, although it's invisible. The point of this uh, uh, figure is that uh, near infrared light penetrates uh, deeply into the cell, into the tissues, and uh, has its own photoacceptors at the level of the mitochondria. Um, one of the most important byproducts is uh, uh, the stimulation of the respiratory chain, which leads to increased production of ATP. However, there is a a uh, transient increase of uh, um, uh, respiratory um, free radical uh, and uh, also transcription factors like uh, the NF NFK beta. Um, those have uh, effects on activation of uh, uh, other transcription factors and, and therefore a cascade of uh, overall uh, not only um, high energy uh, secondary effects, but also antioxidant, anti-apoptotic, anti-inflammatory effect um, that are very important for the health of the cells and also for uh, the neurons. They are also specifically synaptogenetic and uh, uh, neurogenetic uh, effect. So neurogenesis is stimulated, for instance, through uh, BDNF. This is a close-up uh, look at the uh, membrane of the mitochondria, looking at the respiratory chain. And here is the photoacceptor, the primary photoacceptor for near infrared light. And infrared light is that light of the infrared spectrum that is particularly close to the visible. And uh, um, over, over here is a, a higher uh, resolution. Uh, of the cytochrome C oxidase. The effect of the light is to um, basically uh, transfer energy, um, light energy into uh, electron transport and lead to a polarization of the membrane, which then leads to um, the ATP uh, formation as there is a proton transfer involved. ATP is a high energy molecule that is uh, eventually utilized by the cells. Now, um, this is what we do. This is what we are interested in. Um, however, why, why did we want to do this study about simulations, uh, uh, computerized simulation, computerized modeling of the penetration of the, of the light? Well, the issue is right here. Uh, in front of us, uh, there was this uh, gigantic, colossal study um, uh, through three phases, uh, uh, the NEST 1, 2, 3, the look at the effect of photobiomodulation for, for stroke. A lot of excitement, a lot of in investment, up to 40, 50 million uh, were invested in the company that was uh, uh, leading this study. However, at the end of the day, uh, it led to fertility. And um, there was a lot of hope. And the animal models were very promising because they showed that there was an option to re-energize the brain right at the time when ischemia was happening and when the blood flow wasn't quite bringing the right energy, the right oxygenation. So why didn't it work? In, in this uh, uh, important article, Dr. Lachak and Boitano, uh, made an important statement that animal models are not or cannot 
be directly translated into um, the human situation because oftentimes the head of the humans and the skull are different and the thickness matter. So uh, both the, our group and Mass General Hospital and the group of uh, Chen Chen Feng at uh, Northeastern University were dealing with this uh, dilemma of uh, what to do and uh, we wonder if uh, uh, computerized simulation models could provide us with a more concrete, uh, tangible information to use uh, for clinical studies to inform the dose and not to come back to the same pitfalls of um, the previous studies, um, which are very uh, disappointing and also risk altogether to really sink the entire field of uh, transcranial photobiomodulation. So uh, the group of Chen Chen Feng had uh, a simulation model. Um, but before we get there, uh, I think it's uh, critical here to say that there are already very uh, precise data from uh, um, cortical neuron cultures of what dose is needed to make a difference. And uh, um, these are studies of the group of uh, Luis de Taboada, where um, they showed here on the axis um, the, it, the fluence in which is uh, an energy density measure at the cellular level. And you can see here, um, on the y-axis, uh, the ATP production. And this was a fluorescence mechanism. And you clearly see that uh, as the dose increase, uh, there is an improvement in the total ATP level. So a clear marker of the effect of the light uh, at the neuronal level. And then uh, after that, uh, a decrease in the overall effect. And uh, you can see that three joule per square centimeter seems quite a, a right dose to aim for. Um, then when you look here at the uh, mitochondrial membrane potential, you can see that uh, the effect can be seen uh, as a significant effect uh, as close as uh, 0.3 joule per square centimeter uh, at the cellular level. And it's even more obvious at three joules. So um, we have clear data of what we should be aiming to uh, in terms of energy deposition, energy density. However, how do we get there? And uh, that was the question uh, we were wrestling with, with uh, um, the group at Northeastern. So they had a Monte Carlo um, uh, model, a mesh model of the head based on uh, uh, computerized simulations. Um, and uh, it's MCX because uh, they found a particular algorithm to uh, speed up uh, uh, the entire system and, and really provide uh, information in, in real time in, in, in a um, fast manner. So first of all, we chose, our we chose some target brain regions. Um, here's in green and the dorsal outer prefrontal cortex. And in red, <clears throat> the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, uh, this purple area is the frontal pole. Um, there's different ways to define the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, including uh, that area, the purple or, or without. Here, another uh, picture to uh, simulate, uh, show here uh, the uh, location of uh, the device and the light sources in our simulation over um, F4, F3, and over um, FP1, FP2. These are EEG points. So here, another uh, way of modeling. We want to really to be close to the clinical situation. And uh, here is if you put the device on uh, um, basically a three or four, um, you have the device higher up and, uh, or if you put it closer to the frontal pole, aiming at the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. Of note, the distance 
from the source to the target is much greater when you use um, the, um, the frontal pole uh, as a site as opposed uh, um, to when you use uh, uh, higher sites on the forehead close to the hairline. So um, what we wanted to do is make these predictions and then go back to our data and see if the clinical data uh, could be a reasonable uh, testing ground for our predictions and if the clinical data supported the predictions that we had made uh, with uh, computerized modeling. If that's the case, then you could imagine later on using the computerized modeling in a prospective way and uh, therefore inform, as I mentioned before, the dosimetry for future studies and maybe even the clinical applications. Uh, although photobiomodulation is not an approved treatment for, for psychiatric condition. Um, the, the good news is that um, our group at MGH uh, also in collaboration with uh, uh, New York University and with the group of uh, uh, Dana Iosefescu had a, an extensive uh, um, group of uh, uh, series, I should say, of uh, studies. And uh, all of these studies uh, had fairly similar parameters. Um, the wavelengths around 830, uh, mostly continuous wave, uh, irradiance in between 33 and 55 milliwatt per square centimeter, fluence in between 60 and 65 joule per square centimeter, duration of treatment ranging from 20 to 30 minutes, window of treatment uh, um, was uh, obviously a little uh, broader when we were using um, certain devices. Um, uh, and uh, um, so there was certain variability, but not huge. And total energy was also in the same ballpark, uh, uh, three to two uh, kilojoules per session. Now, the first simulation was about uh, varying the dose. So this is a busy uh, table here. But if you follow this table vertically, uh, you can see on this side that um, uh, you're looking on in the parentheses a total energy deliver. And that's an easy ballpark uh, uh, number. So you go from 2.5 kilojoule, 1.5, 1 kilojoule. Now, if you look at uh, the effect on the median energy deposition, it goes from 0 0.5 to 0 0.3 to 0 0.2. Um, so clearly, you get half of the energy if you go half of the energy on the scheme. So this is on the scheme, the total energy, and this is uh, the predicted energy density median um, at the neuronal level. So clearly, uh, and obviously, uh, a dose effect when you were decreasing the dose on skin. Interestingly, um, this um, is the median uh, related to uh, the upper quartile of the voxel, of the, of the cortex that you are aiming to. So it's telling that, um, you know, the values might be uh, and are expected, in fact, to be much lower in uh, uh, the lower quartiles. So um, then we went to the data and uh, we had a healthy subject group of 10 subjects uh, where we looked to different doses. All parameters were the same. The patients were the same, were tested with two different uh, doses. And uh, um, what we found is that, um, interestingly, at a certain dose, um, we could have a significant potentiation of the EEG activity in these healthy subjects, especially in the uh, gamma range, uh, right after the photobiomodulation here expressed with by the red curve, and this is uh, on the Y is the power density 
of the EEG signal, and this is uh, before uh, the light. However, when we cut the dose by one third, this effect was lost. And uh, uh, so here we clearly saw a confirmation of the prediction we had made in the computerized modeling. Another prediction that we made through the computerized modeling is related to the effect of age. So because of the development of the head, the change of the size of the head, uh, of course, from uh, the child to the adult, uh, this is uh, uh, the age in the X axis. Um, and um, there is an increase in uh, the thickness of the tissue. So and the Y is the thickness measured in millimeters. So you can see that that thickness of tissues in between the surface of your skin and the surface of the, of the brain, it progressively increases over time, even as uh, adults age um, and up to the elderly. That's obviously an issue because there is what we call an attenuation of the light signal that is related to this change. And now, if you think about it, you could have a group of healthy subjects around their 20s, the typical volunteers that come in the healthy subject studies, and then you can have the fairly overall typical middle-aged sample around 45 to 50 that is the typical sample that you encounter in a clinical trial and the thickness is not the same and therefore uh, there might be uh, changes in penetration. Um, over here you can see in fact modeling and now on the X the thickness and on, um, on the Y, the average energy density deposition. Now, if you go back, uh, if you see this dotted line, I put here, what's the expected thickness uh, of the extracerebral tissue? So around 45 to 50 age, uh, so year old, uh, you can expect roughly 12.5 millimeter on average, but on the, when you are in your 20s, you can expect probably around eight or so millimeter on average. Now, if you translate it over here in uh, uh, this other uh, plot, now the people who are in the 20s are here, the people who are in 45 and 50 are here. So now go to the red and the green line. This is basically a on a logarithmic scale, the progressive attenuation of the light as the thickness increase. For this example, we looked at the, um, the target from F3, F4 on the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So F3, F4 are the points, the EG point on the skin, and the, the target area is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And you can see that going from your 20s uh, thickness of the extracerebral tissue to your 50s actually is roughly half a point on a logarithmic scale of, uh, of attenuation of the light. So we expect a significant effect here related to age. Now we tested that uh, looking at uh, the same device uh, uh, so identical setting and parameters. And, and we looked uh, at the same group of healthy subjects we had uh, discussed before uh, and a group of uh, uh, 49 uh, subjects with a major depressive disorder. And uh, um, we looked at what type of effects um, we could find here with the same type of uh, treatment. And here, here we go again, the effect we just showed you before in the healthy subjects, uh, the potentiation of the uh, electrical activity with only one session, immediate effect. 
same treatment uh, repeated over time over 12 weeks. Now here in the uh, X, you see the visit numbers. If these were 12 weeks worth of visit. Over here, you have the total score of the quit C, uh, depression score. Uh, and here you have uh, uh, three groups. Um, and these three groups are patients who are randomized either to near infrared light, sham and near infrared light, or sham and sham. And you can see that basically, regardless of the repeated treatment that they were getting twice a week, um, these patients had no difference whatsoever, whether they were getting sham all the time or they were getting near infrared all the time. These were basically mixing uh, and uh, um, interweaving. So at this point, uh, uh, our prediction uh, was somewhat confirmed by uh, this data that uh, if, you, um, if you change age group from these healthy subjects to these MDD subjects, and besides obviously the condition uh, from healthy to MDD, um, you find uh, that you basically lose the effect, probably because of that extra thickness and decreased penetration of the light. Uh, finally, we looked at uh, another element here, uh, which is uh, the probe site. What if uh, we change from uh, uh, the site uh, on the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that I'm pointing here to the site uh, uh, aiming at the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. Here in the graph, it's uh, um, the red and green line show the attenuation of the light uh, with greater thickness of the skull uh, when the light is shed on a 3F4 uh, for the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And here in blue, uh, the most conservative uh, evaluation of uh, um, the light that is uh, um, uh, arriving uh, onto the ventromedial prefrontal cortex uh, when shed at the level of uh, FP1, FP2, FPC. And you can clearly see that for that age group uh, of MDD patients uh, in their 50s who had a predicted thickness of 12 millimeter, if you go from one side to the other, you basically lose one logarithm of, um, um, of uh, uh, light. So dramatic effect. Um, and um, if you see here, um, we, we first of all uh, discussed uh, the impact of um, decreasing the total amount of energy. Remember from 2.5 kilojoule to 1.5 kilojoule to 1 kilojoule per session, um, which obviously corresponds to different energy density at the level of the skin, but also progressively lower energy deposition. Uh, here are the median 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.2. Um, now, think about the added effect of not only decreasing the amount of total energy you're putting on the skin, but also shifting your target, uh, not just vertically, but also horizontally. So you're going from 0.5 to 0.3 in terms of predicted energy deposition, and if you decrease the amount of energy you're shedding, but then you're going from 0.3 to 0 0.07 if you're switching to the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. So dramatic effects when you combine uh, the change in the position of the probe and the change in uh, dose. So we went to test that uh, uh, in basically two samples of depressed patients, similar age, and this was our first study 
um, that was conducted aiming at the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, elated two, was a significant effect of the light here at the active treatment in red as compared to sham over eight weeks. And here again, the, what I just showed you before, the effect of shedding the light uh, uh, on the frontal pulse, some light was also shed on F3, F4, but unfortunately was on hair, when the hair was were also shielding uh, the light. Moreover, the light was distributed among these two sites, so the, the light that was shed on the, on the F3, F4 was obviously less because was, there was some split um, in between uh, the two sides. Uh, so clearly, going lower the dose and uh, also changing the position to the frontal pole was not uh, a good idea. And uh, our model um, was tested and confirmed by our clinical data. Now, so in conclusion, um, using uh, computerized modeling with Monte Carlo simulation extreme is promising. It's promising, as I mentioned before, to predict adequate dosing in uh, research studies to avoid, hopefully, those catastrophic, catastrophic failures that we've seen in the stroke uh, literature and can be useful potentially also uh, whenever we use uh, uh, the tr this treatment, the transcranial photobiomodulation, as an off-label treatment. Um, one note um, that I'd like to make is, uh, as, as you've seen, sometimes uh, um, the median energy in the upper quartile of the voxel at the level of the cortex of the target uh, was 0 0.3, 0 0.2, uh, was really kind of bordering that uh, fork that we've seen as uh, uh, most likely the active uh, energy, um, the, the active range of energy deposition to have an effect at the level of cortical neurons. Um, so this is uh, still a question that is open in the field. Is, is this energy that is kind of borderline sufficient to produce an effect? Uh, um, and it seems it might. Um, however, is the effect indeed related to direct engagement of the neurons? This is still a question that uh, we need to answer. Uh, so finally, I'd like to thank all my colleagues from the depression program, as well as the crew from, of uh, uh, Dr. Fang at Northeastern University, the Nathan Klein Institute in New York, um, as well as uh, the MGH Division of Neuropsychiatry. Thank you.